Not far from New York City is the Tolstoy Foundation. It helps immigrants from Eastern Europe. Running it is Alexandra Tolstoy, 86 years old, daughter of Leo Tolstoy and the 12th of his 13 children. Leo Tolstoy, the Russian writer, was a towering mountain in the world of literature. His novels alone would have raised him there, in particular War and Peace and Anna Karenina. But he was also a prodigious thinker, philosopher and religious man. Alexandra Tolstoy's memories of her father start at the time when most of his novels were already written. His dissolute young manhood was far behind him and his reputation established well beyond the borders of Russia. I remember our family when we were nine, but altogether there were 13 children, and four of them died before, and then my little brother Vanya died later. So after that we were eight, and now I'm the only one left. At the end of the 19th century, the Tolstoy family lived on their country estate, Yasnaya Polyana, 130 miles south of Moscow. He was Count Tolstoy, with considerable lands and fortune, but possessions and status meant little to him. His personal qualities, as much as his literary ones, made him a kind of magnet, attracting the curious, the respectful and the ardent from far and near. When these visitors left, the eminent writer became the boisterous father and hurled himself into games with his children. He used to put us on a carpet and then we would sit on the carpet and he would go around dragging us on this carpet all around the room, the dining room. And then sometimes he would uh, play another game. There was a big sort of a, I don't know, those baskets they had instead of a luggage, you know, enormous baskets, an enormous basket like that. And, uh, they don't use them now. Uh, so he would put us into that basket and would carry us around and then put us into some dark corner and say, well, guess where are you? And sometimes we wouldn't, sometimes we wouldn't. But that was also lots of fun and we take, took turns. My little brother and then I. The other brothers were too big. Alexandra was an unwanted child. When her mother, Sonia, was pregnant, she had tried to abort herself by jumping off a bureau. Later, Sonia lavished her affection on Vanichka, Alexandra's little brother. Alexandra's childhood was difficult and often lonely. Of course, later on, when I felt that I was not wanted, and when my mother gave all her love to the little boy, Vanichka, sometimes I felt a little hurt, but I loved Vanya so much that I understood that he deserved all the love. And somehow it didn't hurt me later on. Sometimes the nurse, when she would give some candy to the little boy and she would forget me. I would get a little hurt, but then Vanya would come in and he would say, and Sasha, why don't you give it to her? Or he would give him, me his candy. So that was so much for me. So it hurt, but not too much, because I understood it. I don't know how. Maybe I couldn't understand it thoroughly. Maybe I just felt it somehow somehow. And uh, the only thing it paid for me, I had a terrible inferiority complex. It was very difficult for me to get rid of it. But between Alexandra and her father, there was an open-hearted love, a close and direct understanding. He was always a friend. I could always go with all my troubles, with all my headaches. And the more I lived, the more I understood him. The deeper became my love and admiration for him. 
once when I had a proposal, you say, from uh, one of the young men, I came and said to him, and I said, I don't want to get married. And uh, I was very astonished when he so seriously looked at me and he said, Alexander, it's your fate. You must think very well. You must think that question through. Or perhaps you don't want to marry because you don't want to leave me. I said, no, I, I simply don't like that man, and I like my work with you, and I don't want to get married. So I got a little bit offended. I thought that you wanted to get rid of me. And then he kissed me very tenderly, and he said, well, all right, then. Then I refused the man, and that's all there is to it. In comparison with my sisters, I was always very homely. <laughs> Once he would look at me, he looked at me so tenderly, and he said, my goodness, why are you so homely? And I just laughed. I didn't care a bit. As long as he loved me, that was all I needed. But uh, sometimes, you know, she would speak to me very frankly about things. And uh, then he would look at me and he said, how sorry I am that you are so young. I can't tell you everything. You won't understand. And I got offended because I did understand all the things that he said and maybe the Greek philosophical things I wouldn't. Alexandra became Tolstoy's secretary, but she began by trying to hand copy one of his tangled, illegible manuscripts. It was very, very difficult because to read his handwriting, uh, nobody could read it except the people who were used to his writing, used to his ideas, what he would express, what he wanted to say. Mm. And uh, of course you had to you couldn't do that when you were 17 or 18 because it was too serious. Only later I understood what he wanted to say and I got used to his writing. I remember the first time when I uh, copied his manuscript, it was, I brought it to him, but it was full of just places, empty places, which I couldn't fill up. And, um, and then the whole manuscript was covered with tears because I was crying all night. I couldn't do anything make out of it nothing. And then later on, of course, I got used to his writing and I could decipher his handwriting, I think, perhaps better than anybody. anybody. In 1901, the Russian Orthodox Church excommunicated Tolstoy, now aged 73. He had pointed out too often that the Church perverted the message of Christ. I think the person who was mostly hurt when my father was excommunicated from the Orthodox Church was my mother. She was a Greek Orthodox believer. She went to church and uh, she was re very religious in her way and my father in his way. The excommunication of Tolstoy made him much more famous than he was before. Crowds of students would come in and he couldn't even go into the streets because everybody recognized him and everybody spoke about it. And oh, loads of letters came in. Outwardly, Leo Tolstoy and Sonia were a united couple. But Sonia was later to write, I lived with Leo Tolstoy for 42 years and still did not know what sort of man he was. She seems to have been a tense and unhappy wife. The shock of the excommunication temporarily brought them close together again. It united my mother with my father for a while because my mother was terribly indignant about the whole thing. And uh, she, uh, at that time, she was on the side of my father. The Tolstoy household was not peaceful. There were bitter scenes between Leo Tolstoy and Sonia, and she regularly threatened to poison herself. She grew more unhappy, more desperate. It was in this atmosphere that Alexandra grew up. My father did not like the atmosphere of Yasne Palyana. What was going on? the servants. He himself used to 
bring his water and take his garbage out and do all these little things and make his bed. But there were lots of servants in the house and he didn't like it. But the worst thing that he disliked were the gods who were brought in because my mother was very angry that the peasants were, I would say, stealing. Nobody wanted that dry wood. Nobody, nothing would happen if that, they would take some, a bag of grass to feed their cattle. My father would give it all away, but my mother felt differently. And this was one thing also that made them quarrel many times, and why the life in Yasna Paliana became very unpleasant for my father. By now, Leo Tolstoy, aristocrat and world-famous writer, was anxious to simplify his way of life. He wore peasant clothes and would walk the 130 miles to Moscow. Even as an old man, he continued to work alongside the peasants on his estate. He was fighting for justice and opportunity for the Russian peasant, advocating love, honesty and non-violence between men. Most of the peasants didn't understand his ideas, but more telling, they liked and respected the man. He wanted quite a simple life like a peasant. I started to understand it very soon. And I understood that my mother really could not follow him. She was a good woman, very honest woman, very devoted to him. She loved her children. But she was a woman like there are all the women are, they wanted something for their children. She didn't understand my father's teaching. She just couldn't grasp it. And this was the reason of the main, I would say, misunderstanding between my two parents. And as they grew older. My father went more and more into his philosophy, into his thoughts, yearning for that simple life that he always loved. And she couldn't understand. Next, the family lost two of its best-loved members. Vanichka died when Alexandra was 11. He passed away in a two and a half days, scarlet fever. And Vanishka was loved by everyone in the house, by the family, by the servants, by everybody who met him. He was a boy that was ready to go. I don't know if you understand what I mean, but I have a belief that God takes people sometimes when they are ready to go, when they're young. He couldn't be better. I remember how we were walking in the estate and my mother would show him all the woods and the fields and say, Vanishka, this is all yours, because he had to eat was to inherit Yasne Palana as the youngest of the family. It was also the, always the Tolstoy youngest member who inherited Yasne Palana. And he would say, Mother, everything belongs to everyone. This is mine. He would always defend those who were unhappy. The other member of the family to die was an older sister, Masha. Masha was married then. She didn't live with us, only she came and visited sometimes my father, but still she was very close to him. We all loved her. And Masha and my mother never 
were great friends because Marshall was absolutely the follower of my father. She, she admired him, she followed him in his ideas, and when she was in the family, she was a vegetarian, she worked with the peasants, she helped them. She even refused to have the share of the inheritance, the property that was divided between everybody. And the loss was especially a terrible loss for my father. He lost a very great friend and a follower in his daughter, Marsha. And I can say with full frankness that I think that she was the daughter whom he loved the most. She was the one with whom he would share his ideas. I was too young. Oh, I had so much love from him, but still I must say that Marsha was more needed for him. He needed her more than he needed me because she was older. Those two deaths, there was a different attitude, both different attitude of my father and my mother. My mother took it as something terrible that happened in the family. It was a great loss. It was something that ought not to have happened. My father took it as a will of God. Tolstoy's growing absorption with spiritual matters seemed to aggravate his wife's panic and insecurity. Among the forms it took was her obsession with what he might have written about her in his diaries. Sometimes my father couldn't keep from writing, sharing with his diary his loneliness. And I was always afraid that if my mother would read that diary, first of all, it would hurt her, and secondly, of course, she would speak out to my father. There would be maybe a quarrel between them, which was a very unpleasant thing. And sometimes I even tried to hide his diaries away so that nobody could see them except himself and me. His hunger for simplicity and calm and the state of deadlock with his wife had made Tolstoy aware for some years of a crucial need to leave home. It was always in his mind. And then as he wrote that he felt that something in him that he has to take care of, he meant his inner self, his independence and his spiritual life, his philosophy, that he was losing that, not losing, but it was dimmed. It was uh, sort of, he was not concentrated on all of that which he had to do because he knew he would die soon. It was those quarrels, it was all those misunderstandings that went on and on. And he wrote in his diary, I feel that I must save myself, save myself what is inside me that may be still useful to people. That inside was his spiritual life. He felt the family atmosphere stifling that inner life. Squalid wrangling among the family over the terms of his will. Sonia's ungovernable jealousy of his friend and disciple, V.G. Chertkov, all taxed his health and strength. Of Sonia, he wrote, she does not even need my love. She needs only one thing, that people should think I love her. This is what is so dreadful. Tolstoy could talk of it only with Tanya and Alexandra, his daughters. We were the only ones, maybe, with whom he could speak quite frankly and tell us about his thoughts about sometimes his misery. Now Sonia's only apparent purpose in life 
was to get hold of the diaries and score out any unfavourable reference to herself. There was nothing bad about her, but there was... My father wrote that he was suffering, that he was tired. And this even he wrote only in his little scrapbook, which he always carried with himself. There was nothing in the big diaries, much as I remember about her. But that added to her anxiety and to her very, very nervous condition, which at the end of her life, at, or I would say at the end of my father's life, the doctors diagnosed as paranoia. She was certainly a sick woman. His diaries became more and more dense. More and more he expressed that feeling, that suffering that he experienced. And finally, I think he just couldn't bear it any longer. He had to leave. As he said, to save, not himself, but something that might be useful for other people. His soul. I was expecting it. And you know, as it is always in life, you expect, and yet when it came, it was a shock. Tolstoy awoke in the early hours of October the 28th, 1910, to find his wife hunting among his papers. This, finally, was more than he could bear. Suddenly there was a knock at the door, and he came in with a little lantern, and he said, Alexandra, I'm leaving. I didn't understand at first. Where? How? Yes, he said, I'm leaving all together. I don't remember exactly the words he said, but I understood that it was very serious. So immediately I dressed and ran over. And he was already, when I got dressed during that time, he already was at the stables where the coachman and the horses were. They were harnessing the horses, and he met me coming back already. He lost his flashlight. It was sort of groping in the dark. Then we went back again to the stables. Then the old coachman, he was so frightened because he said, what is the countess going to say when she knows that I took the count over to the station? Well, it sort of, I wrote it down then in my diary, all that happened. And you know, it's sort of dim now in my memory, how it all happened. I only remember how he said goodbye to me and then left through the orchard to the nearest station. And it was only later that I joined him. He only told me to take care of my mother. And indeed I had to take care of her because she was so hysterical. She was so upset that she even threw herself into the pond, and my father's secretary and myself, we threw ourselves right as we were in our clothes after her, pulled her out. And all day long, several days long, I watched her till the other members of the family came. It was one of the worst times I ever lived through. So my father went with Dushan Makovitsky, and he went to my aunt, Aunt Mary, the nun. And he lived there near the nunnery in a little hotel with Makovitsky. Makovitsky was Tolstoy's doctor. They only stayed at Shamodin Monastery Hostel for two days. Tolstoy became afraid that his wife would find them. So with Alexandra, they set out by rail for the Caucasus. After a night's travel, 
he fell ill on the train. They put him to bed at the station master's cottage at Astapovo. He had all the doctors come again. My sister Tanya and my brother Serge, the closest to him, were at Vetichetkov. And by turns we took care of him. All the famous doctors came, but nothing could be done. Gradually, he just passed away day by day, getting worse and worse. His heart failed. His heart was so tired and he couldn't stand the pneumonia. He's already 82 years of age. Sonia came too, but while hope remained, she was not allowed into his room in case the shock of seeing her should be too much for him. He was very, very, very uh, weak at that time. He hardly could speak. And he said, uh, truth. I lied, truth. On November the 6th, 1910, his life finally ebbed away. The world mourned his death. I came home from the station, Astapro. I came to Yastepolyan. And suddenly I understood that life was empty. I had no one. I had nothing left, absolutely. And I cried my eyes out, of course. There was my father's favorite disciple, Mary Schmidt. She was there. Alexandra, don't cry. Your father wouldn't like it. Let's go and read the cycle of reading which he wrote. The first saying was my father's. Several words. Life is a dream, death is a awakening. And Mary Schmidt said, now you understand, don't cry anymore. It was like something that he told me after his death. Life is a dream, death is awakening. So I dried my tears up and I understood. Sonia who lived on a further nine years, awoke in a different way. There was a great change in her. She was so quiet, she was so kind. Nearly, she was already nearly blind at that time. I remember her sitting in an armchair, being so gentle, not worried at all. No anxiety, no hysterics, nothing at all. As if there she was, punished for all the difficult moments she gave my father. And when she was dying, she told me that. She said, I know I made my, your father's life very, very bitter the last days. But then again, she also said, but I loved him, and we were always, all the 40 years we lived together, we were always devoted and true to each other. So these were her last words when she spoke to me on her deathbed. And we were great friends the last days of her life. 